It's a blessing to welcome on for George Mason star and A-10 freshman of the year, and now the newest member of Marquette, Tyler Kolek. How you doing, man? Doing good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. Well, let's kind of get into this. Obviously, you just announced the big move a little bit ago. You head out to Marquette, being coached by the new returning home coach and coach Stalker Smart. But how's it feel right now? Feels good. I mean, I'm really excited. I mean, I built a great relationship with Coach Smart and uh, all the other guys on the staff, and, and it just felt right to go there. So, Absolutely. We're going to get more into Marquette, more towards the end of this, but I want the fan base to get to know you a little bit better, your story, and how you got to this point. So let's kind of head back all the way to growing up out there in Rhode Island, too. Like, what was it growing up out in Rhode Island? Yeah, I mean, it's a small state. Everybody knows everybody. Um, I mean, it's good. The, the basketball is, is really good. I mean, mm-hmm. we've got a couple of Division One players. Um, and it'd basically be the state of Rhode Island is like like a county anywhere else. That's that, that's how uh, small it is. But, mm-hmm. but no, it's good basketball out here. And, and I mean, it was just fun just, just playing with everybody and being so close to Boston and Connecticut and everything like that. So you meet so many different people. It was good. That's the thing, like you said, obviously Rhode Island isn't like a big state or anything. It's pretty small, but overall, you guys do travel a lot. It's really turns into the whole New England area. So what's that area like, like playing basketball against all those areas with a lot of talent? You mentioned Boston, you mentioned a lot of those places out there. What's like growing up against that kind of talent? Yeah, New England basketball has has probably the best talent in the country. I mean, all the New England prep schools um, mm-hmm. up here, that, that's probably the best league uh, in the country. Brewster, Putnam Science Academy. Uh, Northfield, Mount Hermon, all those schools. Um, and I, I went to St. George's, which is, which is in that league as well. Um, and so, I mean, it's great. I mean, you play, play guys from all over the world. I mean, everybody from, from every, every walk of life, any, any country, anywhere across the, um, the United States, they, they go to those schools. So they're all boarding schools. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's great basketball. Like you said, you chose to go to St. George's. Walk us through that decision. Obviously, you had a lot of opportunity, a lot of different schools you could have chose from. Why was it the school you chose? Yeah, so I went to uh, Cumberland High School in Rhode Island. It was a, just a public school, um, probably about two minutes from my house uh, up until my junior year. Mm-hmm. And then probably the beginning of my junior year was when I really, really knew that I was going to transfer. Um, I was looking at some schools. Um, but ultimately, I just felt like uh, Coach Dwayne Pino, who's a coach over there, um, he really built. I'm I'm a big I'm big on relationships, so mm-hmm. I built a great relationship with him through the process. And I mean, the school is still in Rhode Island, so that was another plus. It wasn't too far from me, or from my family, or anything like that. So, I mean, it just, it just felt like uh, it put me in the best position to move forward, and, and that's definitely what it did. That's the jump that a lot of guys are taking now because we see obviously you want more competition, you want to play the top guys later on. Let's kind of start off with your freshman and sophomore years, obviously at Cumberland High. What were those first two years like? Yeah, my first year, um, I started as a freshman. Mm-hmm. I was actually playing playing with my brother. He was a junior at that time. He plays uh, Division Two at Franklin Pierce uh, University in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was kind of kind of the head of that team, the leader of that team. Um, we were okay, um, but you know, I I didn't really really take basketball. I mean, I took it seriously, but mm-hmm. I wasn't I wasn't very good. I mean, freshman and sophomore year, I. I was expecting, I mean, my brother was getting recruited by division three schools at that time and they would come to practices and everything. And I'd I'd be, I'd be amazed at any, any division three coach would be in the gym. So, Mm -hmm. but no, it was good. And then we went on, we didn't, we didn't have that good of a year. Uh, My freshman year, then my sophomore year, we actually won um, the division two state championship. Um, But, but I had, I actually had surgery on my, on my knee from that to the freshman summer going into sophomore year. So, so I, I played the whole year with this this big bulky knee brace on, and and we uh, it was me, my brother again. He was a senior, um, and then one of my other one of my other buddies, about six five, plays at UMass Dartmouth, Division three school. So that, that that was a good time. So if I would have told you heading into your high school career that you're eventually going to be a guy that goes Division one, you get a good selection of schools as well, but you also go to George Mason. You're going to go out there and eventually win conference freshman of the year, and then you're going to also make a move to a high major like Marquette. Would that ever have been reality? Could you ever have imagined that? Yeah, not 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 my freshman and sophomore year. I couldn't imagine. Even my junior year, I couldn't imagine any of that. I mean, I was I was getting overlooked by even even the A ten schools uh, mm-hmm. coming out of high school. I mean, I only had offers from from probably three schools in that league, and not including URI, which is only about thirty minutes away from my house. Um, and so, so I mean, it was it was it was crazy. I mean, I I had doubts myself, but. You know, after after just going in there and, and putting in all the work and, and it really, really just paid off. 
was there a specific moment like was it just one moment and kind of you kind of remember back like that was the time you started clicking that you realized okay i can be a guy that's going to play at the next level and not even division two like that's obviously great but playing at the division one level like you are one of those elite elite prospects like is there a certain moment you remember that kind of clicked for you yeah it was it was uh my junior year i was i walk home from school every day walk to and from school every day um mm -hmm. i just gotten out of school and probably probably right around this time april um and I, I got a text message from uh, Jared Grasso at Bryant. And that was my, that was my first scholarship offer, um, the division one level. So that was really, that was, that was a surreal moment for me. I remember I was walking and I was in my backyard when I got the text and I stopped in my tracks, read the text. And I, 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 mean, I just called, called my whole family, everybody that, that supports me. And I was just ecstatic about that. So, so that was definitely the, the moment. Who was the first person you called? If you remember that. <laughs> definitely my dad. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's been, he coached me when I was younger, uh, and but I was probably playing in four or five leagues uh, at a time when I was younger growing up um, through middle school and everything like that. It was uh, the church league or, or just travel ball and then the middle school basketball. So he was always coaching me, just being there, supporting. And, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of dads or, or parents um, get, get kind of too involved at some points and, mm -hmm. and try and take control over your path. And I felt like he did a good job of just, just staying with me along my path, but not, not trying to take over and, and really make it his path. And that's obviously clear too, because like you mentioned, your brother also is playing at college basketball the next level, playing at division two. So walk us through that a little bit though. Obviously growing up with a brother that is a collegiate player playing in the NCAA, how impactful was that for your college career and overall just your development as a player? Yeah. I mean, when I, when I was younger, I, I was always playing up with him. Um, always in his age group. I remember I was in, I was in third grade. Um, he was in fifth and it was a fifth and sixth grade, um, like travel, travel basketball. And, and we were in the new England championships and, uh, he'd actually, he broke his foot. Um, he broke his foot like begin earlier, probably three games before that, but we still, we still made the championship. And then, uh, I, was, I remember I was in third grade starting against these, these big sixth graders. And it was just, I mean, that, that's huge in the development, just, just always playing against bigger, stronger, better guys. Cause, I mean, you got to you got to get bigger, stronger, faster to just to compete with them. So that just helped me later on when I did play with my age and go from there. But yeah, my brother, I mean, we, we couldn't play one on one to this day. I mean, it ends in a fight every time. But <laughs> uh, that actually was my next question, though. Like, when is the last time you guys play a one on one and how that game go? Yeah, so we have a we have a little court in my backyard. It's probably um, a little wider than than the paint um, and it goes all the way up to the three point line little hoop back there and we actually played um last summer was our last time and I, I beat him pretty good I don't want to embarrass him with the score but I beat him pretty good <laughs> when was the first time you started beating him yeah um probably not until my, my senior year in high school um mm -hmm. just because I mean he was always like I said bigger stronger mm -hmm. faster and I mean he's, he's still a great scholarship player at the division two level so He's, he's no slouch. He's still really good. Um, mm -hmm. And he always just had the, the physicality advantage over me. So that was something that, it, that he always would post me up and couldn't stop him down there. So, but yeah, I mean, probably, probably this past summer. So when you first think of Brand, like what's the very first number that comes to mind? What's the very first thing you think about when you think about him? <laughs> uh, conflict. I mean, I mean, I'm in my basement right now. I mean, we had, we had all these fights down here. I mean, it was, <laughs> It, it it would get it would get hectic for my parents and everything like that but i mean he, he he's been great to me and and i mean our relationship has, has only grown throughout the years and it's been good absolutely well it's heading to your high school career again and like you said you then make the transition over to the next level you play at st george's and obviously that's where you really create your name you start pulling in all your offers and really creates who you are but take it to the transition and like why was st george's the school you chose as opposed to other schools in that area yeah, I could I could have went to went to a few other ones. Um, none of the really really high level schools, like I mentioned before, like the, the Northfields, the New Hampton, the Bruce, or the Putnam. Mm -hmm. I, none of those schools were really looking at me even then um, either because I don't know. I would I my junior year, my first junior year, I, w I was the leading scorer in the state of Rhode Island. I got uh, all first team all state, uh, made it to the final four of the state tournament, but. Yeah, I mean, I still still was overlooked by by those other schools. Um, so I just felt like it was it was wasn't too high of a of a um, prep school level where I, where I could really excel. And, and that's what I did. 
And that is something that when you talk about yourself, and we, like I mentioned earlier, you won conference player of the year in a conference that's, in my opinion, nearly a high major. I mean, I know some people might say this don't mid major, but the level in the A10 special. So you go out there, you win freshman of the year in that conference. Now you got Marquette that I think will have a bright future there as well. Like you said, you weren't always regarded as a top ranked player. Even coming out of high school, you weren't a guy with top 100 or top 150 type of guy. You didn't have all the high major offers. Why do you think that was? Like, what do you think? Why do you think the reason was that you weren't getting a lot of the offers, a lot of the rankings? Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't pass the eye test. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not the biggest guy. I'm not the fast guy. I'm not the strongest guy. Um, but I mean, I, I have all the intangibles. I mean, I'm the toughest guy on the floor every night. Uh, mm-hmm. I work the hardest on any team I've been on. And, and people don't see that. That's why all people people rank from, from the outside looking in. They, they can't mm-hmm. see all the all the intangibles and all the little things actually go into knowing the game of basketball. And, and that's, that's at the next level. I mean, the game is, is all about IQ. I mean, you're not, you're not ISOing a guy every time like you are in high school. It's you catch the ball, you, you move the ball, you pass, you cut. And so it's really only catch and shoots, catch one move to the rim or one dribble pull up or, or get off of it. So it's not a lot of those guys that are, that are really, really talented and, uh, just use their athleticism in high school to overpower guys. They don't really work out at the next level just because they, they need to think the game at the next level. And that, that's a, the hardest part about it. And that is what I love about your game because you have that characteristic where almost anyone could be like you. Anyone could take you and kind of what they work the hardest, they can get to a point like you. And we see guys like Steph Curry, the Chris Paul, the guys that truly don't have the generational type talents. They don't have the exceptional athleticism, height, length, whatever. They can become you. You obviously have to put a lot of work in. But what kind of mentality does it give you? Like, what, what kind of chip on your shoulder does that bring to you? Like, what, how does it kind of feel you being a guy that doesn't get the tension and kind of becomes something that you have to create by yourself? Yeah, in, in my commitment video, actually, to Marquette, um, my, the, my comment under it was, was bet on me. And, and I just felt like, felt like that, that's what I've been doing this whole time. I mean, if you, if you, if you put in the work and, and really have a dream and goal for yourself, then you can always accomplish that. And, I mean, I've always been overlooked. I've always, and I, I haven't thought thought anything about it. I mean, I just kept my head down and kept working. A lot of guys, when they get overlooked, they just think, "Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm never gonna make it." But you know, the guys that do stick with it, the guys that do keep working hard, will surpass the ones that that were ahead of them just because those guys got by with being more athletic, being more physical, everything like that. But the, eventually, it catches up. It always does. And so like you said, I mean, it is doable. Guys obviously have done it at different levels, many different guys. But how do you do that? Because obviously you guys don't have an advantage on the court, like we mentioned. So how do you, when you step on a court against a point guard, let's say a six foot four, six foot five, is athletic, is long. How do you go out there and not play them? Yeah, I mean, you just got to think through the game. I mean, everything in basketball is just IQ. Um, you don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be the strongest. You can look at, look at Larry Bird back in the day. You can look at Steph Curry. You can even guys like Chris Paul, uh, like you were saying earlier, um, those guys aren't, aren't the fastest. I mean, they're not the strongest, the biggest, but they just get it done because they really know how to play basketball and they know angles and, and they, they know how to communicate with their teammates. And, and every, every little thing like that um, just gives you the advantage over the next person who may be slightly more athletic or, or taller or you know, stronger. So when you make that transition, then you end up going your junior year and you win Gatorade Play of the Year, which – Obviously, I think any kid that's in the in the athletics world, sports world, they know that the Gatorade Player of the Year is one of the biggest achievements you could possibly win for your state. But what was that reaction like when you found out the Gatorade that you won that award? What was going through your mind? How'd you learn about that? Yeah, um, I actually didn't know. Um, you you have to fill out a form to to apply for Gatorade Player of the Year. Um, so my brother actually went to uh, St. Andrews School, which is also in Rhode Island. Um, and so the coach there actually told my my coach because uh, my dad was friends friends with the coach at St. Andrews. My brother went there. He told him like, "Oh, the deadline's coming. You gotta you gotta apply for it. like submit this application like of all the community service hours you've done and and everything that you've done outside of basketball. I mean, obviously everybody can see the the achievements that you've done within basketball, but they want to know what, what you've done outside of it. So mm-hmm. so we I applied for it, and I mean. I, I did I thought it would it would either be me or um there's another kid actually at that school, St. Andrews. He, he, he committed to Butler, uh, Miles Wilmoth. Mm-hmm. Um so I'll be I'll be playing against him again next year. But but yeah, it was I thought it was either me or him. Um, but we had actually we played them early on in the season. 
one of, I think our first game, maybe we beat them by like 20. I, I had a big game that game. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought, I thought that would have helped uh, the head to head. And I mean, yeah, when I got it, I was just grateful. I mean, that's that, like you said, that's, that's a big honor. Everybody, everybody knows Gatorade player of the year. Um, mm-hmm. So it was, it was just really good. So where were you? I know how they usually present to you, but where were you when you found this out? And what was your initial reaction right when you opened it up or found out? Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't even know where I was, um, but uh, it came up actually in my Snapchat memories yesterday, I think was um, I took a picture of it. That must've been the first time that I got it. It got delivered to my house um, here. Cause I, I was on vacation or something like that. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was just opening, opening that trophy. I, I still have it above, above my bed on this little, uh, little frame thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just surreal. I opened that and l- little, not not too big of a trophy. I mean, you see th- those guys that win national get right player of the year. Those those things are huge. But mm-hmm. I mean, just a little trophy, just get recognized like that with the with the other best fifty guys in the in the country. I mean, it was, it was really cool. Absolutely. Well, like you mentioned, that there are a lot of talent in that area. You played against many guys, including Ma, like you said, is Ozzy at Butler. But when you look at all the guys you played against, who was maybe the guy that you enjoyed the most? Like, was there one guy that when you knew they were on your calendar, like you were circling because you were excited to go up against them? Yeah. Um, I don't know about one guy, one team, actually. Um, when I was at St. George's, it, it, it was the Brooks School. Um, mm-hmm. I'd gotten I'd gotten waitlisted there to go to get in and they'd won the league um, or they hadn't lost a league game in six years. And mm-hmm. And so we were coming in my junior year. It was one of our first first few games. Uh, I, I had um, I think I had like 18, 19 at halftime. We were up, we were up 10 at half. Mm-hmm. Come down the first play of the second half. Um, come down, shoot a trailer three, a deep tra- deep trailer three. Guy closes out. I land on his ankle and, I, and I'm done for the game. We ended up losing by like three. Mm-hmm. We probably would have probably would have won that game given their first league loss. But you know, just looking at looking back at that, um, and and seeing them them every time on the calendar it was it was you know you, you had them circle off because they were they were the team to beat and you know they they were one of the ones that, that kind of overlooked me and it, I mean you can get anybody into a prep school it, it doesn't really matter um, well, grades matters to a certain extent but it matters um, the, most of the coaches in prep school are in the uh, the admissions office so they have have some pull to to get guys in and, and are flexible with their grades. So, so I, I definitely could have got in, but it's, it's just a, another person that I overlooked. Um, but but they have a great program over there. We, my senior year, we actually um, split the it – was, it was called the ISL, which is our league. We split the uh, league championship with them. I mean, I, a lot of my friends actually from Middlesex Magic, they play, they play over there. Um, mm-hmm. And the head coach, he's a great guy. So, and Like you also said, I mean, to win Gary play the year two, going back to that a little bit, it's not just about the act, what you do on the court. Obviously, you have to be an elite player to win that, but it's about the community service. It's about what you do in the, in the school room and the academic aspect. It really deals with everything off the court, too. So walk us through that side of you. Like, I know a lot of people see what you do on the court, but what's off the court tire look like? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's not much of it. I mean, I, I, like, I like to hang out with my friends, but I mean, most of the time, you know, when my free time, I'm in the gym. I mean, it's not really free time because – I know, I know where I, where I need to be, what I need to work on, everything like that. But I mean, I, I have a girlfriend. I hang out with her a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it's nothing crazy. I, I was I was big into Fortnite in school when I when I was up at George Mason. But mm-hmm. that's just because you you're kind of stuck in the room because all the COVID protocols and everything like that. So you'd be practice room and and vice versa. So couldn't really go anywhere. But yeah, I mean, not not too many hobbies. I do know you also value academics. So walk us to that side of you too. Like why have you kind of decided to prioritize your academics so much and really put a focus into them? Yeah. I mean, my grandparents always say academics come first. I mean, not a lot of people still say that um, <laughs> even though basketball has got me um, to all these opportunities to go to great schools like St. George's, like George Mason, like Marquette. Now um, basketball has been the, the catapult to get me there. Um, so, I mean, you just got to stay focused. I mean, you got to have a great balance between both. I feel like I feel like I do. I mean, we have, we have studied at George Mason. We had study hall um, three or four times a week um, on top of practice. So, I mean, it's really a full time job when, when you go from academics to athletics and, and everything that it entails. Absolutely. Well, it's heading that senior year for you because that really was by far your best year of high school. We have 23 and four record to lead your team to you employer of the year. You get an ISO title. You get all those different awards coming to play for you. So walk us through that senior year for yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, that that summer um, and, and that, that preseason, I, I really took it upon myself to, to really change my body and change everything, everything about just my approach to the game because I knew I had – uh, nine months until until I was getting getting onto a college campus and and really really getting after it. that's that's when the clock really starts but so I just I just had to had to work as hard as I could that summer and that preseason um, just to be prepared I mean there's no better way of getting better than playing basketball I mean you could do all the skill development you want but playing five on five playing one on one two on two three on three anything like that just playing basketball really is what helps you get better. And, and so, I mean, that's what I did all that skill development stuff, but we're really picking it up, playing pickup um, every day at school and, and really, really getting after and setting the tone from the beginning. I mean, I was a senior, I was, I was, I was one of the leaders on the team. Um, so I had to set the tone every day in practice and, and go hard. And, and I expected that from everybody else. So. Now you look back at your entire high school career what would you say is like the first memory that comes to mind? Is there one specifically that you say, okay, that's my favorite memory of high school? Um, favorite memory was uh, probably two of them. Um, my sophomore year, we won the state championship with my brother. Um, mm-hmm. That was pretty special. I mean, just anytime you, I could do it with my friends, but anytime you do it with, with your, uh, your family members and everything like that, that, that was really special. Um, and then my, my senior year when, when we won the, ISL championship the regular season we uh it was actually our senior night and we we cut down the net so I was up on that ladder cutting down the net that was that was one of my favorite moments this is kind of brought up too then if you remember back like what's your favorite memory from high school in general then not even off the court favorite memory in high school um probably probably just committing to St. George's I mean that was that that was a life-changing experience for me because I mean if I if I stayed at Cumberland I, I don't know where I would be at this point um Still, still obviously be into basketball but I mean when I went there I, I really leveled up and took it to a whole whole new uh whole new level and whole new uh dedication well let's hop into this whole first recruiting process the one that ultimately brings you to George Mason and like I said you have scored like Robert Morris Richmond Siena Penn you have a lot of different schools in the mix for you but walk us through this whole process because like you said it's really didn't get your offers a junior year time when you start really getting through this process and then it all comes together you have to choose George Mason at the end of the day but what walks the whole process? Yeah, so my first junior year, um, that spring, I could have played 16s because I was reclassifying, but I played 17s. Um, and I didn't I didn't really get any offers um, that that spring or summer. I got I got Bryant, like I said. I may may have gotten a few up Brown, um, Holy Cross, uh, schools like that. Um, just a few though, not, not maybe not even a handful. Um, in that spring and summer. So, I mean, that was, that, that was really disappointing just, just cause I mean, maybe cause I was a, a year younger and coaches weren't looking at that level yet, but I mean, I thought, I, I thought I deserved them at that point. Um, but, but when I, when I really started getting everything was uh, my, my junior year at St. George's um, that, that fall, I remember I was on the phone every, every single day. I mean, that's how recruiting works. They would they would come to to open gyms at least twice a week, and that was that was where I got a lot of my offers. and And the recruiting process, I mean, it's long. It's that remember that that junior year in April all the way down to I committed September two year two two and a half years later. Um, so I mean, it, it's a long process, and and coaches are are relentless. I mean, I, I think I had I had thirty plus offers or twenty five plus offers, and and all of those schools were were still in contact with me. Till the very end. I mean, it was it was phone calls every day of every every hour. I mean, it was kind of it, it, it was uh, it was overwhelming at times. But I mean, that's just how the process is. And you, you got to do your due diligence with it and and really sift through who, who you want to be around and, and who you can build a great relationship with. Like we mentioned, I mean, you achieved all these big awards, Gator Player of the Year, Player of the Year on ISL title, state championship, like all this goes on. But I was talking about earlier, you didn't have the rankings yet, and you didn't necessarily have a ton of the high majors yet. Obviously, there's a lot of big schools in that area. Did you ever kind of get down yourself because of that, or how did you handle not necessarily getting all the attention you probably deserved? Yeah, I mean, I, I, st- I still work super hard, and uh, I felt like I, I earned everything that has been given to me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was it was a little, little shot in the arm when uh, 
schools like like URI, like like Providence College, um, like the local schools um, that were a little higher level, didn't didn't come take a look and, and take a chance on me. Um, but you know, you can't hold that against anybody because they're just doing that job that maybe they don't see it at the time. Um, it's not anybody's fault. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, I mean, it, it, that stuff just drives me to, to work even harder and just to to kill whoever's in front of me um, on the basketball court. I mean, that that's really where the chip on my shoulder comes from. Just everybody, everybody looking, overlooking me. No, it does jump a little bit ahead, but we do know being in the A-10, there's Rhode Island there too. When you get to go up against a team that is the home state team, is there a little bit of something extra behind that when you go out there and play a team like Rhode Island or any hometown team? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, this year um, when I when I was announced in starting lineup at URI, um, one one of the guys is his name's Dan York. He he's the PA announcer um, at URI, and he he does like local radio. He he uh, he announced some of my high school games in the state finals, everything like that. So so he added a little little extra to the to the name uh, when he was calling it out in the starting lineup. So. I mean, that, that was special. It would have been special if there was fans there, but just getting off the plane um, and just seeing familiar grounds, familiar roads, everything like that. I mean, it's definitely special. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have the chance to do it again next year. I'm going to be going down to the uh, Dunkin' Donuts Center and play at Providence. So. Absolutely. Well, let's hop back into that recruiting process real quick because, like I said, you do choose George Mason, but was there another school you'd say it was like number two, number three? Like, who was their backup plan if George Mason wasn't there, if you even had one? Yeah, I, I I had the final four. I took I took visits. Uh, my first official visit was to Elon, um, and then my second official visit was to George Mason, and then I took one to Northeastern and and Holy Cross. So those four schools were were really really probably the final four. Um, but getting into the process, I mean, Coach Paulson, who who was the head coach at George Mason, recently got let go. Um, he 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 built a great relationship with me. Um, he, he actually coached my AU coach, Mike Crotty, in, in college at Williams, Williams University. They won, they won a Division three national championship there. Um, and it was so, so he just did a great job recruiting me, uh, telling me the vision that he saw. Um, so, I mean, I, I just – I felt like I went uh, with the highest level where I, where I could – felt that I had the best opportunity to play right away. And that, that's all that really matters in the process. I mean, just having a head coach that believes in you and, and looking at the roster and being able to see that, that you can go in there and play right away. And like you said, having a coach that trusts you and he clearly did give you the opportunity, you play at a, probably, probably the highest level you could have possibly went to anywhere in the country in terms of production. But that's something difficult because a lot of coaches will go out there and say, yeah, we're gonna, you're going to be guaranteed minutes. We're going to start you. We're going to do this and that. Ultimately, that's not the case for all coaches. So what kind of led you to know that, okay, I can tr- I can really trust Coach Paul's name. He's going to be someone I can trust that I truly feel that I, this is the right place for me. Yeah, I, I, when, during the process, I mean, I really do my research. I, I value other people's opinions. So mm-hmm. I knew people that, that knew him very well, like my AU coach, like, like other coaches uh, around me that were involved with me. So, I mean, I, I really just did my research. And, and a lot of schools do, or not a lot, but some schools do, promise things, um, promise starting lineups, promise certain minutes, everything like that. But most of the time they they don't hold up on that. I mean, I like when a coach will, will just give it to me straight rather than just try and try and lie and, and BS his way through things. Um, so, I mean, it was good. He, he just, he just told me the vision that he saw. I mean, he was honest with me and, and I was honest with him and, and where I was at and what I wanted. And I felt like it was a great match. So when you start talking to him, did he expect for you to become a starter? Did he think you'd have this good of a season or was he kind of planning you to kind of develop a year, maybe even come off the bench? Like what was his original kind of goals for you for your freshman year? Yeah, uh, we actually had preseason meetings. Um, and, and I remember, so it was like one-on-one with me, me and Coach Paulson. Um, and he had met with the staff earlier in the week. And they were, it was probably early in the pre, not early in the preseason, but leading up to the game, a few weeks to the games and, and the staff sat down and said how many minutes they thought that that I, I should get um, per game. And then he also had like how many he thought. So the staff actually said I, I would play. They thought I should play around 16 minutes a game. He thought I should play around 18 minutes a game. He, he would sh- he shared that with us. And and we actually did the exercise. It was everybody in the room together, all the team. And everybody wrote down on a piece of paper how many minutes they think they should play a game. Um, Cause there's only 300 and something minutes for five guys. Um, so, so um, that, that's a good exercise to really put it into perspective. Like 
a lot of guys aren't going to get the time that they that they want or or think they deserve. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first three games, I was I was only playing twenty minutes a game, um, eighteen to twenty minutes a game. I was, but I was finishing every game. Um, that was that was one important thing. I mean, close games that that were it was winning time. I, I was in there at the end, um, so that that was a good sign. And then we actually went to a COVID pause, and and some things happened. Um, and and right after the COVID pause, the fourth game, I, I was I was thrown into the fire and put in the starting lineup. So. I mentioned earlier you being in the A-10, this isn't like just a low major school or something, but this is a conference that you're competing against a lot of really talented freshmen. A couple of guys, obviously, Jordan Hall is a special freshman. Mustafa Mzil is a big-time freshman. Like, there are some guys that were really tough competition. We ultimately get that award. You are A-10 freshman of the year. But did you expect that from yourself? Like, if someone were told you before the season starts, like, you're going to win freshman of the year in this conference, was that something you could have seen yourself, like, really seen the future for yourself? I mean, yeah, I set, I set the bar really high for myself. Um, I mean, I, I, at the beginning of the year, I was, I was hoping I would have made a conference team, um, all conference team, but I mean, that's just the type of person I am. That's just ty- the type of work that I put in. So I see myself and in, in all the things that I do to prepare for, for all the moments in the games or something like that. So, I mean, I definitely, definitely didn't expect it, but definitely, uh, had the feeling because, because of all the work that I put in and everything like that. But, but like you said, there, there are some great freshmen in that league and, and great players overall. Like you mentioned, too, COVID obviously had a big stance on your guys' program as well as pretty much every program in the entire country this year. But you didn't really get experience a normal college season yet, at least. But for you, just having experienced the daily COVID test, daily kind of locker room things, all the masks, like everything that came with the COVID pandemic, how did you deal with that? How did you handle it this year? Yeah, it was hard. It was hard on the, on the mental health, on on everything. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we'd go to practice um, early in the morning. We'd be back in our rooms. Um, we – Pretty much the only place we'd go was class in the dining hall, um, and then e- even even so, we couldn't we couldn't go home see our family. We couldn't do a lot of things. I mean, when we when we had the COVID pause, um, we were in these there's like this uh, hotel style dorm that they were keeping everybody in that that was positive or, or close contact, and, and we were in there. Everybody had their own room, isolated. You couldn't leave the room. It brings food up there, and I mean it was hard. I mean that not being able to go outside for, for two weeks is, is not pleasant at all. Um, so, I mean, but, but I mean, everybody was dealing with it in the country. I mean, it wasn't just us. It wasn't an isolated incident. Everybody had to go through the same stuff that we did. So that's, that's pretty much what, what made it easier knowing that it wasn't just us going through that. It was, it was everybody around the country. You just said the whole sitting in a hotel type room for two weeks was that for the entire school, like anyone on the campus, rather athletes, at basketball, football, or even just normal students? Like, did anyone that has COVID stay in that hotel? Was it just the basketball player, just athletes? Like, what did that hotel type thing look like? Yeah, it was, it was anybody that was a close contact or um, somebody who tested positive. But the basketball team, we were all on the same floor. Um, and nobody, nobody else was, was on that floor. It was just us. Um, but yeah, it was there was other people in the in the hotel scattered throughout who was either a close contact or a positive. So when you're going through that, it's obviously not easy because we know for a basketball player, it's all about consistency. It's all about producing and keeping your body in shape. And for you guys to go midseason, you already are peaking at that point in time. You're getting ready. You're in game shape. Send it out two weeks or even longer, and then you have to go out and play again. How would your body adjust to that? How would you deal with that? Just preparing for a natural game in terms of keeping your body ready. Yeah, I mean, I I'd never gone two weeks without touching, without shooting a basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, and probably since maybe sixth grade or, or fifth grade, I mean, it's been a while. Um, but, you know, that was just something that we had to deal with. They, they brought us um, exercise bikes into our room. Uh, they, they had uh, virtual workouts with our strength coach, um, everything like that to just try and stay in shape. Because, uh, I mean, we were right in the middle of the season. We would come out of the pause and, and play a week later. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't easy. Once we got out, a lot of guys were slow, slow footed, out of breath. Um, I mean, just, I mean, it felt, it felt like you're picking up, picking up the basketball for the first time again, just cause you're right in the middle of your season. You built up preseason, all the hard work you did, all the workouts you did, you beginning of the season, you've already played a few games and then all of a sudden it just shuts down and stops. So, I mean, it, it's really difficult to, to deal with that, but you know, I mean, like I said, everybody was dealing with it. So it wasn't just our disadvantage. It was everybody's disadvantage. And so I thought you, you have a few different flashes of really how special you can be, especially down the road. And one of those games were was 19 points against UMass. You have another 19-point game against Norfolk State. 
take us to those two nights. Like when you truly get going, you get 19 points in a game. What was different about those nights than other nights? Yeah, I mean, I felt like I felt every night I felt good. Um, I mean, those those nights were special. UMass game especially. Um, I I think I I only I only scored one basket in the first half, two points. Um, and then the second half, we it was it was a double overtime game, and probably I think six guys fouled out from our team. So so I mean, a coach, the coaching staff, and, and the players really depended on me down the stretch, and I, I just made some big shots, and and my my teammates really put me in good spots to to make those shots. It's not easy for any freshman just to get acclimated to the college level, but especially being a guard position where you're in charge of facilitating for a lot of guys, your guys can be leading the team, being one of the voices in the locker room. How did you emerge as one of the leaders in, on that team so early on in your career? Yeah, like I said before, it's, it's all about basketball IQ. I mean, mm-hmm. not many people have a higher basketball IQ than I do, and, and, and that's important. I mean, being a, being a point guard being or even, even an off-guard combo guard, any, anything you want to call me, um, you, you're the ones that is conducting what the coach wants. You're, you're relaying the messages to the other guys that maybe don't understand the play that was called or, or the play that was drawn up. Um, so you, you got to be kind of, kind of an extension of the coach. And I mean, anybody can do that. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a captain, if you're, if you're a freshman, sophomore, I mean, you, you, there's leadership qualities in, in everybody. I mean, not a lot of people are, are, um, as really, really bold and, and want to put themselves out there. Like, I feel like I, I had a good balance. I mean, I was a freshman coming in, obviously didn't want to overstep my bounds, but you know, you, you have to do what you have to do at some points and, and really, really lead guys and direct them, even though you're, you're a younger guy on the team. Now you look at the list of guys that you were able to match up against this year at the guard position. Fats Russell's coming to mind right at the gate. Nashawn Highland, who I'm super high on bones. Also his teammate out there is pretty solid as well. Ran the point guard. But you got a lot of guys, night in, night out. You're going up against some of the top guards in the country. But who personally was your favorite? Like, was there one guard that you enjoyed going up against or maybe not even enjoyed, but you just were like, wow, this guy's real good? Yeah, def- definitely. You said Bones Highland. I mean, he – so we played them at our place, um, and then we played them again at their place. Um, and it was, it was a close they, – they beat us by probably five or seven the first time at our place. And then we went down there, and we actually beat them down there in overtime. But but he he had sprained his ankle with about maybe a minute and a half to go in the game, and then and and, and they were up maybe five um, at that point, and and he he makes that team go. I mean they were a tournament team just because of him. I mean he he can do special things with the basketball and score it any time he wants. I mean he's really smooth, uh, like microwave type guy. He just gets it when he gets it going. He just doesn't stop. But you know when he went, when he went out, I mean they they kind of they struggled to score. They they still defend really well, but they're just out of sorts without him. Because I mean late clock, you pl- you can play a great possession of defense. The final seven seconds on the clock come up, they just throw him the ball, and he he makes a great shot. So I mean he he really he really um, led them and and got them to where where they were this year. And as some I don't think it's got enough attention. I was I was really upset. I wish they could have played in the tournament this past year. We know they're the other one team. Thankfully, there's only one, but. Wish there was none that couldn't have played in this tournament. But like you said, Bones is the guy that I personally think is a top 20 pick. There should be a top 20 type pick this upcoming draft. He's not an easy guy to game plan and guards. One of those guys that ultimately you probably say, okay, he's going to get some buckets. Let's, let's kind of get away from him. Let's make sure other guys don't beat us. But what was your game plan when you go up against a guy like Bones or Fats Ross or any of them? Like, how do you guys game plan for a guy like that? Yeah, all those guys. I mean, Jalen Crutcher, uh, Dayton, Fats Russell, uh, Bones Highland, I mean, all those guys. Kyle Lofton at, at St. Bonaventure. Um, those are all the, the great guards in that league. Um, I mean, you just you just gotta gotta watch a lot of film and, and see what they like to do and just try and take that away. I mean, you can't take great players. You can't take everything away. They're they're gonna find a way to to score the ball or, or do what they do best. Um, so you just gotta try and limit limit one or two things that that they like to do. And at that point, I mean, just hope for the best. I mean, a lot of those guys, we, we kind of on the ball screen, we blitzed them, double teamed them, just tried to get it out of their hands and try and make the other guys beat us. Mm-hmm. When you look at the final moment, the, probably the biggest moment probably for your George Mason career is ultimately getting freshman of the year. Where were you when you found out that out? Because obviously we know the season's probably over and you're sitting at home or whatnot, sitting on campus. Like, how did you find that out? Who told you? And what was your reaction to that one? Yeah, I was, I was actually back home. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I just worked out 
I was in the car driving back um, from my workout and I was on FaceTime with my girlfriend. Um, and I, I, was, I was actually parked. I was parked after um, got into a gas station. I was, I was on FaceTime with her um, and the Twitter notification popped up. Mason men's basketball tagged you in a post and it said, and it said, congratulations, Tyler Kolick, A-10 rookie of the year. Um, I was on FaceTime with her. I was just like, oh, I, I, and I told her. And then, you know, I, I, I hung up with her and, and told my dad. Um, and I mean, just called everybody that, that, that was along with me for this journey. And, and I mean, just had to, felt like I had to share it with them because it was such a special moment for me. And then not the best thing obviously happens when that coach Paul's and all of a gets let go. And obviously then you decide to put your name in the transfer portal, but there's obviously a lot of changes. Like some guys can see, you yeah, obviously the high coach English to come in. Was that something you ever considered? Like was coach English someone that you were looking at considering going back to, or are you kind of saying, okay, I have all these other opportunities. I'd rather go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I, I really didn't want, want to leave. Um, I mean, I love my teammates over there. Um, love the school. Um, and I actually, after he was named, uh, after he was hired as coach, we started uh, spring workouts and I, I went down there for a little while um, just to just to really get a feel for what he was like, what his coaching staff was like, how he was going to run the program. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, I, I thought it was great. I, I thought um, he's got great energy. It was a, definitely a, a good switch uh, from what it was um, doing a lot of workouts, a lot of skill development. But, you know, ult ultimately, I felt like I felt like I owed it to myself. Um, to, to kind of move on and try and move up. So, mm -hmm. so was that an opportunity? Like, was Coach English still saying, hey, we want you back, we still want – was he still trying to recruit you then, or was it he kind of also just saying, okay, it's going to move both ways? Yeah, I mean, he was he was definitely trying to recruit me back. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, all the fan base and everything like that was great too. They, they would always uh, try and mention me on Twitter and everything like that, trying to get me to come back, but – I mean, he, he was definitely recruiting me to come back. He, he flew flew up to, to Rhode Island uh, to meet with me before I'd actually went down there. Um, but no, he, he, he's a special guy. And I think I think they're going to do great things over there, George Mason, this year and, and years beyond. Were you shocked by the by Coach Paulson getting let go? Were you kind of aware of it? Did he talk to you guys before announcement came through? Like, how did you receive that? And what was your thoughts on the of him being let go? I was, I was definitely shocked. I mean, mm -hmm. he so I guess he had met um, – he, he had met with us before um, and told us, I mean, all right, guys, we'll, we'll get back to you. So we were going home after the season. So we were planning on uh, coming back for spring workouts. He said, we're going to have a Zoom meeting, uh, figure that stuff out. And, and then uh, a week later, um, a week later, we, we got the text messages, oh, Zoom meeting in 30 minutes from, from our director of basketball operations. Um, and, and I thought it was odd. I mean, they always give us a day or two day warning for it, for any of those things. But so I knew, I knew something was wrong. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know exactly what, but uh, yeah, we got on the zoom meeting and and he told us that, that he was let go and that said his final words. And then the athletic director hopped on the meeting and, and said his words. Um, and, and we went from there. But. So if coach Paulson was still the head coach, do you think he'd still be at George Mason? Yeah, I would. I, I wasn't thinking about transferring at all. Um, I felt like felt like that firing really, really forced my hand and, and really opened up new opportunities for myself. Absolutely. Let's get into the good stuff now. I see you're moving out. We're going to Marquette now, which obviously is a huge opportunity in the Big East. And you had a lot of big schools. You, Marquette wasn't the only school that was interested in you. So walk us through this. Obviously, it had to be special. Now you are getting all those phone calls from the high majors from all kind of programs. Like, what was this next recruiting process like? Yeah, I mean, the the transfer process moves moves so quickly. Um, I was I was in the portal for probably one of the, one of the longer guys in the portal. Um, I was in there for only only even a month, um, but still, guy guys enter that thing, and then three days later, they're they're already committed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it's a crazy experience. I I entered the portal, um, so you got to email um, your compliance person. Um, email them that you'd like to answer the transfer portal. Then they ask you for some information. And then at nine o'clock, I remember she, she emailed me back and said, um, you're all set. Your name is now in the transfer portal at nine Oh one was, was when I got my first phone call from, from, uh, from a school. So, I mean, it was hectic. I mean, they, they try and build relationships because it's so fast because the process does move, move crazy. So 
And, and what didn't help was, was that you can't get out and visit anywhere now. So I was kind of just, like I said earlier, just doing it all off of relationships. So that was, that was a big part, um, talking on the phone, getting on Zoom meetings, everything like that with their whole staff and, and my, my camp that was helping me. Was there one coach that you remember, like, you, you picked up the phone, like, wow, I got a call from this coach. Like, was there that one I really talked to? I mean, Coach Smart was probably that guy. I mean, he, he, had led, he led VCU to the Final Four. Um, he obviously did great things at Texas. Um, and, I mean, he, he's a household name to, to anybody in the country. Um, he actually called me on my birthday. Um, and I was I – was, I was, we were doing, like, a little – little thing in my backyard with just a few of my family members, my grandparents, um, a few other people. But, yeah, I just wrote up. So the phone, and he said, hey, this is, this is Coach Smart over at Marquette. Um, and then I, was, I, was, I was shocked. I mean, he's, he's probably one of, the, one of the ten coaches in college basketball that even if you don't watch college basketball, you, you, you can know his name. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was really good. And I, I built a great relationship with him. Um, and, and like I said, just – Probably, what's the day today? I mean, it's a- April 20th. I-, I committed maybe five days ago. He-, he called me March 27th. So it was probably 15 days of, of even knowing him. I, I committed to him and, and Marquette. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it- the process, the-, the transfer process moves really fast. And, and you got to be diligent with, with the um, thought process that goes into it. Now, I've interviewed a lot of guys that were originally from Texas that commit to him because of him at Texas. Now, I've caught, talked to a few different guys that have now gotten to Marquette. I've got to know him. And everyone mentioned that he's got that kind of that vibrant energy about him. He's got a special kind of vibe about him that's just different than a lot of coaches. So explain that to us a little bit more. Like, what's his energy like, his personality? Like, what's Coach Shaka Smart just on the phone so far, obviously, but just what's his personality like so far? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a player's coach. Um, he really knows how to connect with his guys and, and relate to them, even though – he played basketball, but he wasn't a high level player like some of the guys that he's recruiting, uh, some of the guys that he's gotten to come to his schools. Um, but I mean, he's 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 on FaceTime with me. He's, he's talking to me about everything. It doesn't necessarily have to be about basketball. I mean, that's a great thing when you have a coach that you can really uh, relate and connect to. And you don't have to always talk about basketball. It doesn't always have to be business. You can just be be having a having a normal conversation, like like he's he's one of your uh, one of your friends or something like that. Even though you respect him and he respects you, and and you would go to war for that guy. So, well, this is going to be a whole new look Marquette team. Obviously, it hasn't been the best days. The past coaching staff coach Bojo and them obviously had a guy Marcus Howard who was phenomenal, but. Aside from that, there really hasn't been too many bright spots in terms of wins. But so far, this group coming in, which, which Coach Smart brought in, obviously brings David along with him that came from Texas. We've got Olivier coming in now from Clemson to transfer in, as well as yourself. Stevie he was able to keep and Cam from super high on. Kean and Mario, like a bunch of guys are coming in. On top of obviously returning guy like Osa, Justin Lewis, Dawson Garcia could come back, and I hope he does. But you look at this whole group, the way it's coming together right now, this nucleus, this young core. How special are you guys looking? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the guys that he brought in um, and the guys that he had there. I mean, mm-hmm. winning is is really important to me. And I, I felt like they had the roster over there to to really win and win at a high level. I mean, I, I expect us to be in the tournament next year and, and making noise in the tournament. I mean, so it should be good. I'm really excited. So have you talked to these guys yet? If so, who are they and how close have you gotten to these guys so far? Yeah, I, I only committed probably, probably five days ago, six days ago. Um, and so, so I haven't really uh, gotten to know anybody yet. Um, I've been on the phone with Co- Coach Smart a few times. He, he, he's uh, shown me a few of the guys. I've talked to him a little bit. But, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than, than going down there, being on the practice floor, and being able to, to, go, to go to war with them and, and sweat through everything and, mm-hmm. and really, really grind with them to, to really build a relationship. That, that's, that's really what it comes down to. So what does Coach Shaka want in you? Like, what's the role he wants you to play? Does he want you probably starting, competing for that starting point guard, shooting guard spot, off the bench? Like, what, what does he want you to bring to the team, both rotation-wise, but also just impact-wise? Like, what will you bring to Marquette? I mean, yeah, not, nothing's guaranteed. Um, he, he's not one of the guys, like I said, that that will guarantee starting spots or anything like that. You just – you got to earn whatever you whatever you get, and and that's what I intend to do. I mean, I intend to, to work really hard and just just earn everything that, that I get and – and he, he likes to play three guard sets and, and really up tempo and, and shoot shooting a lot of threes. So I feel like that'll really benefit me because 
and I can really shoot the ball, stretch the floor, make make high IQ plays for, for my teammates and everything like that. If there's one word, what would that word be to describe everything about you? Like if you're talking about you, but on and off the court, what word represents how I call it? Yeah, um, I mean, just confidence, confidence in, in the work that I put in. And and that, that's all it is. I mean, you see Steph Curry last night, he had maybe 48 or something like that. I mean, he's had five games, uh, five games this year, over 10 plus threes. Nobody, nobody else even has five games in their career with 10 plus threes. I mean, that guy's uber confident. And, and that's, that's what it is to be a shooter and a scorer. And you just got to be super confident in, in your game and in the work that you put in and that you can miss five shots in a row and, and make the next four. You just got to believe it. So. So you will be in the big East, obviously a new, a new conference, but that conference, a very, very special conference. Is there one team specifically you're most excited for? I know Providence, you said, would be turning back home, but is that the team you're most excited for? Or is it someone else? I mean, not necessarily the team, um, but more so playing in the Dunkin' Donuts Center in Providence. That, that'll be really special. I mean, mm-hmm. never played on that floor before, um, but but I, I when I was a young kid, I mean, I had season tickets to – went to almost every game with my dad um, and just really enjoyed being down there. That atmosphere, I mean – there's nothing like it. That that fan base is is great, and and I I know a lot of people there will will know me, and I'll I'll know them, and and it'll, it'll be a great great experience for me. Absolutely, man. Well, something I was like wrapping up discussing is building a legacy for yourself because I know that all guys all want to be remembered for something. So when you do step away from this game someday, what do you want to be remembered for for to achieve both on and off the court? Yeah, I just want to be a winner. I mean. Coach Smart said, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about winning and, and doing the things that go into winning. And I feel like, I mean, I'm not going to be remembered as, as the most athletic, the, the fastest, the strongest. I'm just, I just want to be remembered as a winner and, and a guy that goes out there every day and competes and, and works his butt off every day. Absolutely, man. Well, final thing for you, give Marquette fans your three biggest goals you have set for your Marquette career. Uh, three biggest goals. I mean, win the national championship, win win the Big East title, and and just have fun. I mean, that, that's all it's about. Just having fun playing basketball. Because at the end of the day, it's it's a kid's game. It, there's there's a seriousness about it, but you know, you, you gotta just gotta have fun when when you're playing basketball. Absolutely, man. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking time to come on today. Congrats on the big move again, and I'm excited to see what God got next for you, man. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Of course, welcome on, man. God bless. Thank you.